And I think that, you know, just the act of asking people what they think or how they feel or how they're doing, like that, that in itself is, I think it's a positive step. Business of Architecture, episode 386. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we're taking a human-centered approach to architecture with discussions with Dr. Tyrone Yang. Now, Tyrone graduated with a Master's in Architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design in 2002, and he also has a PhD in Cognitive Psychology from the University of Virginia and a BA in Psychology from Cornell University. Currently, he has recently founded Architectural Health and Yang Architects. And prior to doing that, he worked as a designer and project manager at Butts and Klug, um, Rizvi Architects, and also Mushi Safdie Associates, and worked on a larger range of projects. Tyrone's academic involvement includes classes in psychology and research methods at the University of Virginia, and classes on human factors and sustainable architecture at Wentworth Institute of Technology. He's also worked as an affiliate researcher and course collaborator at the City Science Changing Places Group at the MIT Media Lab. And currently he's teaching environmental design research at the Department of Architecture at Roger Williams University. Tyrone is both a licensed architect and a member of the AIA and the Boston Society of Architects, where he has co-chaired the Small Practices Network. And what's really interesting in this conversation as we discuss the overlaps and how Dr. Yang's research into cognitive psychology has underpinned his architectural approach and how that has manifested in his current entrepreneurial ventures and business ventures um, and how he's positioned himself as one of the world's leading healthy building design consultants. So sit back, relax and enjoy Dr. Tyrone Yang. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Tyrone, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Uh, good. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for having me. My absolute pleasure. Now, you've had one of the most interesting careers. I think I've had the good fortune to interview somebody about. It's a really unusual architectural path. Uh, and actually, you've got, um, you started your academic career in psychology. Yes, uh, yeah, I did. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking in preparation for this interview, it was, it was actually a nice opportunity to think about all this and how, how it's eventually come, come together. So I did, I did st- study psychology as an undergraduate and um, as a graduate student uh, focusing on visual perception. Right. Um, but I think that, uh, I, I, like, thinking back at, uh, about this, um, this interest in psychology and in architecture, I think these were um, present even in, even when I was in high school. And, mm. and um, uh, I, I think during, for, for many years, I, I was uh, a little bit undecided about how to, how to pursue each one of these uh, interests and, and ended up uh, tag teaming on uh, pursuing both. Well, it's, it's quite common, for example, for architects to take a, a pseudo interest, if you like, in perception and how space is perceived and we kind of we can get interested in the in the kind of cognitive mechanisms that create our experience of reality but you know you you ended up actually doing a phd at the university of virginia um and went quite deep into a field of study how did how did you kind of transition from there into architecture yeah so i think um when I was in, when I was an undergraduate, um, in my junior year, I uh, did a career discovery program at, at, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. It's an intro, mm. intro, introductory um, class to um, for people who might be considering architecture. And then at the same time, in the fall, I was preparing to do a, a senior honors thesis in um, in psychology. And the the 
project that I did as an undergraduate for that senior thesis was looking at uh, false perspective spaces. So um, taking, taking um, uh, spaces that are, um, uh, taking a space and then accelerating the perspective, right. converging the walls to make it look, look longer. And so in some ways, like, like as you've pointed out that arch architects have had um, interests in perception and, and the, the Baroque and Borromini, those, in that period of, um, in that period of time, you, you, you can see that, that overlapping interest between um, architecture and, and perception. Um, and so that's like in that period, I, that, that's what I um, looked at. And then in, in my graduate studies, uh, the, the kinds of things that I was looking at there um, were, th there was some overlap with, um, with, um, with, with architecture and, and the perception of space. Um, so um, one, of my, one of the projects that I worked on was looking at perceiving pictures, perceiving perspective in pictures. Mm. Um, there was a second project looking at um, virtual reality systems. So this is like back in, let's see, like back in the, in the mid nineties when virtual reality was not quite so um, commonplace. And we had, had one, of the, one of these early systems and it was a little bit, uh, you know, compared to what's, what's out there these days, it's, it was um, a little bit more primitive, but it, but it was exciting at the time. Um, yeah. So um, just trying to, we were trying to understand the advantages of virtual reality versus a um, more, uh, more traditional desktop um, uh, type of system for representing space. Um, so, so how, obviously that's a, that's, a, that's a high level of understanding that you then bring it into an architectural thesis, if you like. What was the work that you were doing at Harvard um, or your, your graduate design work? Um, how was that being influenced by this study in visual perception? Yeah, so, you know, I, I feel like during that period, um, it was, there was, um, you know, I think that, during that period, I was so, what was more focused on, there's so many things that I needed to learn. I was more focused on uh, something a bit more, just understanding the basics of, um, of architecture um, that uh, there probably wasn't as much of a focused, that kind of focused in, um, exploration during right. that period. I, I guess, you know, there, there, there are a couple of, I mean, the psychology always pops up in various, various ways and, and, um, I guess like during that period, um, drawing, like taking a drawing class um, and uh, having studied picture perception before, like some of these things in, in the back, back of my mind, um, I'm, I'm still aware of, but I think in terms of a focused, focused exploration um, in, in, in that, in graduate school of our, um, in architecture and a um, professional school, there was um, a bit more um, trying to understand the field generally, as opposed to a, mm. a PhD program, I think there's a there's more opportunity to um, drill down on specific problems. So, so w when you left Harvard, um, you then went on to be working. I've, I've seen you've got some really amazing bits of experience, and uh, you were a research affiliate at MIT. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, what yeah, sort there, of things were you doing there? Yeah, so there, it was a, um, it, in the beginning, this, this uh, research lab there was called House N. It was the MIT home of the future, but eventually that group, um, I, I worked with them for a little while, and then a couple of years later, I, I came back and worked with them, and, and it, that group evolved into, um, uh, like, their the scope of their work shifted and, and broadened um, they became a, a group called changing places um, mm. uh, which which was, was kind of a blo um, broad platform to study various things um, one of, one of which we be, um, became um, trying to understand urbanism and um, and using data to under to inform the design of cities and then and then how did your career begin to progress from there to uh, yeah you know it's um it's i think it's been a, a, a sort of an evolution um i know one, one of the questions that you had sent over as, as your the, the uh was was there um i think you i think there was a question about was there a point where i um where things sort of shifted and came together and i, I feel like 
thinking about it, uh, this has been a, a sl- in some ways a slow, slow evolution. But there, I guess there was one point where this all started to come together, these, this interest in architecture and, 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 and psychology. And I think that, that it was probably in the, um, when, I, when I encountered the, with the well building standard, uh, yeah. which um, is, is like, like LEED. Uh, like LEED has been around for maybe 10 or 15 years. And so I think most people are, um, even, even people who aren't architects are, are familiar with it. And um, well is sim- similar to that. It's a, it's a rating system for buildings that helps to, um, that's aimed at elevating the, the, the buildings that we, um, the quality of the buildings that we make, but it's more focused on human health as opposed to uh, more broadly on sustainability. One, one of which you know, in sustainability, there is a concern about health, but, but uh, I think that when, the, when I went to uh, the Green Build Conference in DC in two, two, uh, 2015, um, that's when I um, encountered the well building standard and started to get involved in that. And, and for you, what is the, what does the well building standards mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's looking at, well, the, the primary goal is to, create buildings that are healthier for, for people. And there are many, many different ways to approach that. I don't think there's a single um, silver bullet for encouraging health. And so um, it's, it's a very broad standard that touches on a, a lot of different aspects about buildings and design that could have uh, impacts on um, our health and maybe specific body systems, mm. let's say. And how does your, so after you, you kind of been involved in, in, you got introduced to well, this was obviously a kind of a natural fit for you as it kind of encompasses a lot of the areas that your expertise uh, encompasses. When was it that you decided to set up Yang Architects? Yeah, so that, um, it, it, that's a good question. So I, um, Yang Architects, the, the work that we do is a bit more of a traditional architecture firm. It's a small, traditional small ar- architecture firm. And um, that, that came about uh, right around the time of the, the, the recession. I think that at that point, I, I was laid off from work uh, along with other, some other people. But, you know, and fu- the funny thing is that these... This is the 2008 recession. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it, was, it was kind of a gradual process. I mean, around that time, I, I um, also uh, was was working at, um, at teaching as a uh, adjunct professor at, at Wentworth, one of the architecture schools in the Boston area. And I was getting my um, ar- architecture um, uh, um, license, uh, the, the exams for that um, done. Um, so that, that's, that's around the time that I thought that, well, at this point um, during this recession, it's probably just as as much of a challenge to try to set up a firm as it is to find find work, and so I thought, well, why not why not give it a try? <laughs> and and what was the kind of what were the first sort of projects that you were focused on? Yeah, like um, you know, it's it's funny. Like uh, thinking back at the the at at that period, um, we. Um, I think one of our first projects was a was just a, a wine shop in in Watertown, Massachusetts. So not not so not so far outside of Boston. Um, we also worked on a, a lobby renovation for a, a YMCA building um, in in the area, um, and uh, some a little bit of residential work and starting started to get into that. Um, and how did you those first projects? How did you find them? Hmm. You mean how? How did I find the find the clients? For, yeah. How for did that? you? Yeah. How did you win those initial projects? Yeah. They were they were all um, and and I think you know and, and uh, to this day I I think that uh, they're all through personal connections and and um, one of the uh, like the the wine store it, it uh, I I knew the owner of a, a middle East, middle eastern restaurant in near nearby and had gotten to know him over the years. And um, I think I, I mentioned, and at that time I was, uh, as I was talking to people, I would, I would just let them know that, um, 
I'm starting this practice. And if, if you know of anybody who needs uh, architectural help, uh, let, let me know. And it turns out that his, his son uh, and his son, his daughter and uh, son-in-law wanted to start a wine shop. And so we, so he needed, needed our help, uh, needed my help. And uh, um, so that's, that's how that got started. How, because it's, it's really an interesting story. Obviously you've, you've got a lot of different um, skill sets and kind of specialist domains of knowledge. And then you might start working with a residential client and how do you start to feed in all these different interests and areas of expertise into those sorts of projects? And how has it started to shape your business agenda going forward or in the last 10 years? Yeah. So I think um, in terms of more traditional projects, I think, um, I think the opportunities to um, bring in some kind of a psych- psychology background are, are a bit more broad in so- some ways, like as opposed to being um, a bit more specific, I guess. Maybe, for instance, like I think that um, like the idea of setting expectations, that's, that's always something that mm. uh, I think architects um, res- wrestle with. Um, uh, um, there's always like with architecture, with all these different parties going into forming a, a building, there's uh, bound to be conflict at some point in time or dis- disagreement, um, not, not, not um, sometimes heated, sometimes not, not so heated. And so um, I think that there are a lot of, I feel like there are a lot of soft skills that are important in the practice of architecture. Um, and so how do you, when there's when there are these disagreements, how do you um, manage those, or what should you be aware of, or what kind of um, styles of managing conflict uh, mm. do you have? And so one, you know, what, in one of the the, um, the graduate class I uh, have taught at Roger Williams, one of the first things that we give to the students is this um, this this inventory to for them to understand how they collaborate with other people and how they manage um, those kinds of, um, but like what are their styles for, for dealing, personal styles for, for dealing with conflict? What are their, what are your weaknesses and what are your strengths or what do you, what do you tend to do? And I think having those kinds of awareness, uh, that kind of awareness helps um, in, in the architectural process when you're, when you have, have the, um, when you have to work with a lot of different people who have different responsibilities. That's really interesting. How, how do you help people um, ascertain or develop awareness over what their leadership style is or what their particular yeah. communication style is? Yeah, the, the, the particular um, inventory that we use is called the Thomas uh, TKI, Thomas Kilman um, in, Inventory. Right. Um, and um, it's, there's no, I, I think one thing that's interesting about it is that there's no, there's no, best way of going about um, going about managing conflict that it's the, I think the idea is that in certain situations certain things certain styles are a bit more effective and if they're misapplied to another situation then mm. they're they're no longer as as effective and so um, uh, for instance like let, let's say if you I mean I mean I mean, you could, you could think that um, it would be a great idea to get everybody's input a, on, on a situation. Um, uh, but that like a, a problem that, that that's happening, but if, if something is really, really urgent, then um, having those kinds of discussions don't really work and, and somebody needs to make an executive decision. So I think people have different, uh, tend to have different uh, styles and, um, I, I, the purpose of that survey, that that inventory, is for was in the class was for the students to understand their styles, and so that when they were doing group work, um, they they're they're aware of where they um, the, the strengths that they have and and some of the weaknesses that that they they might also have that they should be aware of. Mm. So I hadn't really considered that actually. The fact that of course your work might have been involved with perception 
But of course, we're talking about emotions, how you perceive emotions, how emotions are going to perceive, you know, affect how you're perceiving space and other people, of course, and yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I, I think that's a good point that, that it's, um, that my, although my primary interest is, is in perception, um, the, um, there are more general things about psychology that, that sometimes come into play in, in practice. And, um, so, so how does some of the, the kind of, yeah, the, the deeper work that you've, you've done in perception, um, how was that kind of coming through in some of your early projects, if you like, if at all, mm. or, or, or was it more the broad kind of connections? Yeah. Hmm. I think that there is, um, there, there, there are some, some areas that it, it, uh, just having it in the back of my mind. Um, I, I think it must influence, um, how we think about design. I mean, for instance, um, just being by uh, making sure that everybody has a, has a window where, where they work. Sometimes, sometimes that's possible. And sometimes that's, that's not, I mean, I, I think that there's sometimes there's certain things that you can't do just from the constraints of a project, especially if, a, if it's a renovation and, and existing conditions and, and budget, but those, those kinds of things are, I feel like it's the idea of having a window um, is, is such an important Thing. And um, now that I've gotten into well, um, it's, it's giving me a, a bit more of a deeper understanding about why that's important beyond just being um, something intuitive, which I, I think probably a lot of architects would, would appreciate. Yeah. Um, so um, like getting into well, I think it, it's been an opportunity to understand some of the scientific basis of what, what, what's, what's happening and how light helps to set the biological clock and that if that clock is not correctly set, um, it's like being a uh, jet constantly jet uh, having a, uh, in, in being in a mild sense of jet lag and over, over decades of time, if you're, if you're a person who has to travel for work all the time and you're constantly resetting your clock, that, that kind of, or, or you're a night shift nurse, let's say, and sometimes you're working the day, sometimes you're working at night. Um, those kinds of things over, over a period of a lifetime, over decades, um, have have been linked to certain chronic diseases. Um, so, so there's there's kind of an I guess there's an understanding at an intuitive level about what what would be good, and then a, probably a, a deeper level of um, like how does the research what does the research say specifically okay. about these things? When you're working now as a as a as a health building design consultant, for example, what sorts of uh, projects do you get pulled into or do you get asked to look at? Yeah, so um, I think the focus right now has been working on um, going after projects um, that are focused on work workspace. I think that yeah. some healthy buildings, it applies to all, all sorts of different, um, different building types. Um, but I think part of it... Um, uh, the, the market demand right now seems to be more focused on, on workspace. I, I think with the pandemic, there's, there's been some more awareness about schools that have aging systems that were underventilated to begin with. And so I think that there's some intention there um, that that's, that's being um, brought, to, brought to light. And, um, but I think the, with workspaces, it, it seems like it's uh, easier for, the owners to try to understand that um, that a building that's healthy also impacts the bottom line and could potentially give a competitive advantage for various things like just attracting talent. Let's say. So this this is interesting because it's it's a, it's very niche in its you know what what you're doing and the expertise that you're that you're bringing to it, but it's also a new niche in many ways. How do you, how have you gone about like marketing or developing marketing strategies for, for this niche? And is, and is there any, is there much competition? Yeah, I think that um, probably with any sorts of uh, innovations, there's a, there's a period where, there's a period where um, you're, you're the early adopter and maybe the rest of the world doesn't seem to, um, 
catch on. And then there's, there's a certain point where that starts to happen, where, where mm-hmm. people start to feel it, understand the value of that. And then maybe there's a period where um, at some point in time where that, that market gets, starts to get saturated with uh, a lot of people having that, those, that skill set or that interest. Um, but in terms of um, mar- marketing, like marketing, you're, you're ask, are you asking like, how do we communicate the value or how do we just generally go about both. developing business? Okay. Yeah. So I think that, you know, in terms of finding the work, I feel like um, with architecture and with a lot of consultancies uh, as business, uh, as businesses that are, um, have a consultancy business model, it's, it's been based on relationships um, that, that I think that's, that's uh, key. Um, something like a, a product that you buy, it's, you, you could probably use a, a good website to, to sell it. But I think that with something that's a bit more involved, like, like architecture, it's mainly based on relationships. Um, and there, in terms of like the specific ways that we've gone out mark, to market this, it's, uh, I, we've been trying a, a lot of different, a, a lot of different things. Um, one of which, um, which I, I feel like has been, um, feels like it's been it, it's been a good investment of our time is um, doing presentations to various architecture firms. Um, right. I guess here here they're called lunch, lunch and learns, where a lot a lot of product uh, man, uh, product rep, reps will do something like that. Well, well, they'll come into an architecture office, and and the, and the presentation that we give uh, gives a continuing education credit for for architects. So yeah. it. Um, that's a way to help um, uh, offset the, the time investment that they that they put into uh, that architects put into speaking with us. And and that would be then pitching the idea of collaborating with an architect on a certain type of project to make sure that it's it's reaching well standards. Yeah, yeah. So so I think that like the um, in the role that that. Um, I'm getting into as a consultant, we, we would no longer, like, even though I'm trained as an architect, I would, on a project, I would no longer be the prime. So an architecture or, mm. um, firm would, uh, would, would be the prime and we would come in as a consultant, um, similar to like having a, a structural engineer or a, acoustics consultant uh, or an engineering consultant. Um, we would, we would be helping a very a specific part of the project. Got it. And how does the consultancy business model, how does it differ from architectural service business model? And are the, are the two kind of quite compatible or do you, you make a, a clear distinction between when you've got your healthy building design consultant hat on and when you've got your architect hat on? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it is pretty, I, I'd say it's pretty separate. Um, and, and I think that um, my uh, plan right now might be to like, as um as the healthy building consultancy, if that starts to grow and that starts to take more time, I, it, it, I'm, I'm thinking that I'd like to focus a bit more time on, on that. And then with the architectural work that, that could potentially, I mean, depending on time that could potentially get, uh, could, could wind down or, um, or there's a chance that I might be able to find help from someone else to help manage that. But I think that the, my current plan is to try to try to shift more, my attention a bit more to, um, the architectural health, uh, the healthy building consultancy work. Can you can you explain a little bit about how the healthy building design consultant, um, how that plugs into another architectural practice? How you collaborate? Yeah, yeah. So we would um, most well um, if if the architect or the project is uh, pursuing certification for a healthy building certification like well or there's another one called uh, fit well um, then we would our primary responsibility would be to manage that certification and give input to the the architects and the owners um, during the design process so that it, it could achieve um, a, a level of certification uh, but not not all projects I think um, necessarily will wa- want to be officially certified. So um, one of the projects that we worked on last summer uh, or uh, last year at the kind of at the beginning of the pandemic uh, was a project where we looked at um, some of these certification systems, well, fit well and, and lead and um, used, used that as a reference for 
advising the owner on steps that they could take to um, help people feel safe coming back to the uh, to, to the to their building, and then in the future, um, the owners wanted to use those kinds of that kind of focus on health as a way to give them give their buildings as as landlords a competitive advantage. But we in in that project, they weren't interested in um, in investing in in the official certification. Right. So it's not it's not hasn't become something which is um, you know the planning approval processes are dependent on and they say you must reach you must reach a well level five for example in order to get planning permission does that kind of thing happen at the moment or not yet not not yet i I, i'd say that um like looking at lead it seems like once 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 upon a time it was a uh, an optional certification and but in other um uh um now the, those kinds in in some with some organizations um perhaps some municipalities that has become uh, a certain level of lead certification has become a um a mandatory baseline but i i think for, with well that that's uh that's not the case quite quite yet um, how long has well been going for let's see so um it was, I encountered it around 2015 and it had version one had been launched um, maybe a few years before that. And, and then a, about seven years before the launch, they, it, it took about seven years for the um, organization that was developing well to uh, compile, compile all the research that was needed to come up with the first version of the standard yeah. and um and, and write that first version of the standard. Um, the same with Fitwell. I think the uh, the Fitwell standard, which is which is similar, took about the same amount of time. Um, and, and strangely, they 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 both launched it around the around the same time. Um, these two very similar standards. Do you um, do you then have a lot of a lot of data for? companies offices where you can demonstrate like increased levels of productivity for for staff and actually have the kind of metrics if you like where you're able to demonstrate profit and growth for a business that have have got buildings that have been well designed yeah yeah so i think that uh i i think um probably in general architecture projects um they don't necessarily have the uh, like a, as standard practice. They they don't always have the resources to collect that kind of data. But yeah. we there are there are I, I think what what helps is to look at some very very specific case studies where mm-hmm. there has been that investment into um, into a project. And so one of the ones that we uh, when, when we do a present when we talk to architects and we do a presentation, one of the ones that we bring up is the. Um, the AS, ASID headquarters in Washington D.C., the American Society of Interior Designers. Um, that was a build, that was a project that achieved both uh, both well platinum and, and lead platinum. It was it was the first building in, in the world to achieve um, both well and lead platinum. Right. But at, at, and, um, and and one one thing is that they they were they did a lot of pre and post occupancy work on that building, and so there's a, a bit of data um, from that 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 we used it um, to, when we speak, to, speak with architects. Um, that, that's interesting that, yeah, you're quite right that most practices, it's a difficult thing to actually go and collect that kind of research and actually to go and collect that kind of data. Um, we know it intuitively, like you were saying, we know intuitively that a window is going to have an impact on the, somebody's well-being in a, in a house. And yet these are the things that, we'll often find ourselves fighting with when projects are getting value engineered or when developers are kind of saying, look, we need to make it hit the bottom line or we need to be hitting these upfront metrics. And it's these, it's these sorts of things that, that often lead to the kind of qualitative things that get taken out first. How do you, um, how do you, how do you, what kind of recommendations do you have for, uh, for practices to, to kind of negotiate around that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, this is one of the, one of the areas where I think there is still a challenge um, when dealing with owners. Um, Part of, part of it, I think is that 
there in, in a, or, a client organization, there are um, different groups that have very, very specific interests. And so there's um, the, the group that's managing these projects and trying to get them, get them in un, under budget. Um, but what they design is going to have impacts for larger impacts for um, the organization as a whole or other areas. So, um, name like one of the or, one of the one of the other groups that could be impacted is HR, like human resources. I think people people who are doing human resources don't necessarily think about um, the quality of buildings and how that could impact things like productivity or um, retention, um, recruitment. Uh, or health, even in, in like the, the health, um, health expenditures. Yeah. Um, the, and, and at the same time, um, people in uh, the um, real estate uh, part of the organization may not be aware or may not be um, directly impacted by these effects that are down, down the road. Yeah. So I think that one of the, um, one, one of those, one of the big challenges is, is to get all those people from those different um, um, parts of the organization at the same table to be able to work these things out and try to understand things, understand the project in a more holistic sense. How, and how, how do you try and facilitate that? Yeah, so I think that at, at the beginning of, of a project, one, one thing that helps is to have a, some kind of charrette where these, these groups come, come together. And in, in some ways, like that, um, a more traditional architecture role in a more traditional project has that, those kinds of, um, those kinds of um, responsibilities or those kinds of challenges as, as part of the, the job function. I, the architect... Um, in some ways in, in, in the project is the, the generalist who brings in all the specialist consultants mm. to, to try to integrate uh, all the competing, um, competing challenges and, and find, a good, find, the, find an ideal solution to, to address all those things. Very interesting. So what's, um, in terms of what you're, the work you're doing with Yang Architects and with being a healthy building Con- consultant how is the business unfolding for you how what's the ne- what are the next steps in its evolution yeah let's see well so one 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 big thing that the, the big uh, well one of the big projects for the summer is possibly integrating with a, another company so um s- someone um brian salazar is a um colleague that i've been um getting to know over the co- last couple of years and we, we worked on a project together last summer. Um, and so this, this summer, one of our, one of the things that we're working towards is merging, merging these companies um, or, or taking steps to, to merging them. Um, and so Brian does, his, his company Integra does, uh, focuses, ha- has been working for about 13 years on sustainability, um, and um, helping helping organizations with things like lead certification, and, and now he's gotten into to well and fit well also. Um, but um, this this merger would um, right now I think the the, the working name we, we're still looking for a good uh, good good uh, catchy company name. But the the uh, the working name is Integra and Architectural Health right now. Got it. But that's that's kind of the the, the next big step that we're that we're working towards. Brilliant. So that's again a, a, a very interesting set of services under under one roof, and um, kind of linking in with the both the well and the sustainable aspect, the sustainability aspect of it. Um, does this mean that the kind of traditional architectural services will will start to take a back seat? I, I think for myself, yeah. I think it's it's more of a personal decision, and and just um, having limited time um, thinking that maybe, maybe it makes more sense to, to try to focus on growing the consulting, consulting part of the business. Um, Brilliant. Very, it's very, very exciting. I was going to ask you a bit about what would be your advice for other practices who are interested in well-being? Um, like how can they start to integrate these sorts of services into their design practice? 
Yeah, so I think that um, probably the first step um, would be to become uh, just more knowledgeable about, about some of these things, uh, possibly becoming a, a well AP or a fit well ambassador. And so that's, right. that's um, just having that uh, certification. I think that that's a good, good first step to, um, to under, understanding these things. And then I, I think that it's also, I mean, I, I feel like one of the things that's pretty important is to start having those conversations with the, the owners and, um, and part of that is trying to educate the owners, but the other part is, I think is a listening part and trying to understand, well, what are their, what are the things that the, the owners are really struggling with? What are their pain points? And I think that's probably just um, good business practice to um, have those, have those listening skills, have those um, tr trying to really understand, do, doing things that are, um, that can really make a difference for the, the people that, is, that are supporting your practice as, as, a, as an owner. This is one of the things that we always talk about when we're discussing sales and marketing is like understanding the client's problems, understanding their pain points. As you say, it's a good business discipline and having the capacity to be able to listen also kind of, you know, helps you understand and tease out problems that clients are having. Having What are the sorts of problems that, that you would be able to point to that typically clients are experiencing both on a commercial level and a residential level around the kind of wellness of their buildings, if you like. Yeah. So I think that um, it always helps to have metrics if, if, you, if you have them. And then I feel like it always, it, it helps even more if those metrics can be translated into, into dollar signs. Um, and it's, it's a little hard, in, in some ways, it's a little bit more challenging to understand the impacts of building on health that compared to something like energy, energy expenditures, those, um, some, some of those sustainability metrics, um, I feel like are, are easier to understand. Like if you get the, if you get the energy bill, um, there's a certain, you know, if you use less energy, if you use less energy, then, then you know that, uh, that you're saving money, but with productivity, it's some, sometimes, uh, that can be, a, seem a little fuzzier, but there are, um, when, when you look at some of these buildings that have been studied in a bit more, in a bit more depth, um, there are ways to, there are proxy measures that you can use, for instance, like absenteeism rates, or um, in some types of businesses, you can, you can measure productivity a little bit more. And if you can translate that into uh, dollar signs, that, that, that really helps. Um, but so, so I, I guess with, with productivity and, and human health, even though it's, harder to measure when you actually do measure it, um, what you, you find that it's orders of magnitude more impactful than, um, than, than some of the other, uh, some of the other expenses that you, that, that a building owner may have. Mm. This is, it, this points to that kind of one of the difficulties that we all experience as architects is that in again the kind of intuitiveness of well we know that this is going to be a high quality space and that this is going to contribute to the richness of the experience and to the quality of somebody's professional working life or their private life um, but how do we quantify it or how do we communicate that to somebody without them actually spending 10 years and even if they did spend 10 years in that thing, they would get used to it and that would become their normal level of, of being. And they won't necessarily notice it until they go into another space, which has not been so well thought out and considered. And they start to, to suffer, if you like. <laughs> in, in, when they see the comparison. Yes. Yeah. And so, and so for our, us as, as designers, there was this, um, you know, the, the importance of being able to have metrics is, you know, that's a, it's one tool that we can use. Um, and so I'm always interested in, yeah, what, like your advice and like how, how to kind of keep opening up this conversation with clients, if you like. Yeah, I think that with, with the metrics, it, even though it's hard to, some, they may be hard to come by for individual projects that uh, um, it, it, if you can point to example projects where there, there has been that research investment, that, that really helps. And so this, this ASID project, um, there, there are a number of different metrics that they, they uh, use mm -hmm. and, and a number of things that they tracked. Like they even had um, 
well, first of all, they studied the, um, there's a pre and post um, uh, occupancy study where they studied a, where the researchers looked at the, uh, the employees of ASID in a, in a temporary space that they inhabited for a year. And then a post-occupancy study looking at um, how things changed when they moved into their uh, well and lead certified space. Um, so one, one of the measures was just how um, like absenteeism rates, um, surveys reporting for um, uh, the employees reporting on their own um, mental and physical health um, and um, trans translating some of those numbers into productivity. Uh, uh, what they what they were what they've argued in some of the reports that they on on this project is that in the first year of occupancy, ASID figured that they probably saved about seven hundred thousand um, dollars, and that over the the course of their ten year lease, they're projecting that they're they're going to save seven million dollars in terms wow. of just having people be. Uh, present and and productive in in the office um, compared to maybe a more traditional space. Amazing. Now that 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 that's very compelling stuff when you start to frame it like that, and the and the business can kind of get something tangible of right. Crikey, yeah, that's a that's an enormous change in in revenue and fulfillment. We talk about it as well, like in terms of. Um, you know, people know the importance of business culture, for example, in an organization and how important it is for people to have clear, structured career paths and to feel like they're contributing to something and their levels of fulfillment. And all of this is also kind of manifest in the physical spaces that that people are, are using and how, you know, the, the subtleties and nuances of how people communicate with each other effectively. And of course, our buildings are playing a role in in assisting and facilitating good communication amongst people. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely. I think that um, like one of the one of the, um, these surveys on millennials and uh, current values that people have um, or people in the workforce are looking for in a, in an organization. I think one of the one of the surveys. Um, that's looked at those kinds of work attitudes uh, has said that uh, compared to previous generation, like the current um, current um, uh, pe people in the uh, young people in the workforce, one, they would um, they uh, would be more willing to trade off. Uh, they would more be more willing to um, value uh, workplace quality compared to maybe other other benefits like other more traditional benefits just like like um like just salary level for instance um mm. so that that i i think that maybe culturally there um there's been a, a trade-off for valuing the quality of a workplace over other maybe more traditional um uh, compensations that a, a job would give very interesting Brilliant. I think that's the, the perfect place for us to, to conclude. And um, what's the, so you, as you said, the rest of this year, you've, you're the merger. Yeah. The merger this summer is that's, that's, that's one big project. Um, another big project is um, uh, well doing well performance testing and getting into understanding and using equipment. So that's a, that's probably a bigger, another, another uh, thing that we probably uh, um, don't have too much time to get into. Um, I, I think. Excellent. Uh, well, what, 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 is, what does that entail? The, the second so, so, yeah, I mean, uh, briefly, so the, with the well performance testing, uh, with well certification, one of the things that you need to do is to go into a building after it's being built, after it's been built and measure um, the aspects of the building that, that the design is trying to achieve and um, make sure that everything is, is performing as, as um, it was intended. And so sampling the water quality uh, understanding the air quality, making sure that, that at a sample of workstations, um, everybody is getting sufficient light or, um, or just looking at the noise levels and in, in the space and uh, making sure that the mechanical systems or the, 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 uh, um, the noise outside is not loud enough that people can't do effective work. Did you do surveys with the occupants 
asking them about their experience and well-being and their kind of emotional attitudes towards the spaces yeah yeah so it it, it yeah I, I that's that's a that's an important component as well that uh, there are these um, um some of these more uh, i guess you could say in some ways you could say more phys, uh, objective or physical measures but then mm-hmm. but then ultimately like those the some of the subjective experiences that's that's important as well um and, 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 and I think that, you know, just the act of asking people what they think or how they feel or how they're doing like that, that in itself is, um, is, 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 I think it's a positive step for an organization to take so that people feel like their, their voices are being heard, that they, um, uh, that they have some kind of say in, in, in what the organization does, I think is, is that act in itself is, is um, really, really valuable. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Tyrone. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you and I'm very interested to hear on how the business evolves over the summer and um, to keep hearing about your fascinating research and the contributions that you're making to the built environment. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on the program. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.